Hi everyone, so now we're going to continue on with our inventory costing and capacity analysis with another example of a variable costing and absorption costing income statement. But this time it's going to cover multiple months. So we can see what happens when maybe our production level is not the same as we budgeted. And then we've got to incorporate some type of variance within these income statements. So here we have NASCAR and... The same as before, NASCAR Motors, they assemble and sell motor vehicles and use standard costing. Actual direct data um, relating to April and May are as follows. The selling price per vehicle is $24,000. The budgeted level of production used to calculate the budgeted fixed manufacturing cost per unit is 500 units. Okay, so that's important to note because when you look up in the data table there, we see that production in April met the budgeted amount of 500, but in May... It was 100 units less, so that, that may play a factor in our income statements that we have to pay close attention to. There is no price efficiency or spending variances, and any production volume variance is written off to cost of goods sold in the month in which it occurs. All right, so we already know if there's a production volume variance, in other words, a difference in the amount of production budgeted versus the actual level of production, then that variance will be written off to cost of goods sold. So our goal here is to prepare an April and May income statement for NASCAR Motors under both variable costing and absorption costing. So let's go ahead and together we'll look at April to start with. Okay, so we will start with variable costing and we're going to set up our income statement for April and we're going to compute a contribution margin income statement under variable costing, just as we did before. So we'll start with our revenues. And to calculate our revenues, they tell us in the story down here that the selling price per vehicle is $24,000. So revenues are $24,000 per vehicle that we sold, which in this case our sales are three hundred and fifty, dollars which we can see in the data down there. That comes out to be $8,400,000 our revenues for April. From revenues, we'll subtract all of our variable cost to get contribution margin. So we'll start with cost of goods sold. Now, if we look into our uh, information here, the variable manufacturing cost per unit produced is $10,000. Okay, so cost of goods sold is $10,000 times the number of units sold because we're calculating cost of goods sold and that will give us three and a half million dollars. We also want to subtract other variable cost. In this case we have variable operating costs and if we look down at the story we see that we have other variable cost, operating cost per unit sold of $3,000 and we sold 350 units. So that gives us $1,050,000. So we end up with a contribution margin of $3,850,000. And just like with our normal contribution margin income statement, we're going to subtract all of our fixed costs now. So from contribution margin, we're going to subtract our fixed cost. We have manufacturing fixed costs, and we have operating fixed costs. So our marketing fixed cost, if you look down at the spreadsheet there, our manufacturing fixed cost are $2 million. And our operating fixed cost, our marketing cost, are $600,000. So that will leave us with an operating income under variable costing of $1,200,000 and $50,000. So let's also think about this in terms of our inventory T account here. 
which we would also find our cost of goods sold number, which is right there. Okay, so this number should appear right here as well. So we already know we calculated it earlier, but let's just make sure. So we had beginning inventory is zero from our spreadsheet there. And since we're doing variable costing, our inventory is made up of our variable manufacturing costs, which is our direct materials, direct labor, and variable overhead. It does not include fixed cost at all. So in this instance, our variable manufacturing cost is made up of $10,000 per unit times the number of units produced, and we produced 500. So our variable manufacturing cost under variable costing would be $5 million. So if we had $5 million sold $3.5 million worth, we would end up with $1.5 million. But we can also calculate this ending. We know that the cost of each unit is the $10,000. That's our variable manufacturing cost. And if we look at the spreadsheet over here, we started with zero, we produced 500, and we sold 350. We must only have 150 left, and that's where we get the 1.5 million in ending inventory. So what I'd like for you to do now is I would like for you to attempt the month of May. So press pause on your player and attempt the month of May. Once you feel like you've got it, come back and we'll take a look at it together. Okay, so here is April and May together. And what you will see is that it, the process is pretty much the same. Nothing really outstanding here as far as the calculations being anything really different. Um, the fixed costs are the same for both months. We calculate our cost of goods sold just like we did earlier based on what we sold. Then our variable operating cost. Um, so... Not much difference going on here, so I'm assuming there's not a whole lot of questions with the way it's set up. But what I do want to point out here is making sure that you do understand that the ending inventory from one month becomes the beginning inventory for the next. So that's why I simply move that over into my inventory T account there. And that is variable costing. So remember, variable costing only includes variable cost as part of cost of goods sold, so that would be direct materials, direct labor, and variable overhead only not your fixed cost, or not fixed overhead. And also, we're using a contribution margin income statement for variable costing because we want to be able to separate costs by how they behave. Now, let's take a look at absorption costing. Okay, so remember absorption costing is the method that is approved by GAAP and under absorption costing, we're going to use a gross profit income statement. So just as before, we're going to start with revenues. And revenues are the same under, both met under either method, so I'm not going to recalculate that for you since we already know that number is $8.4 million. From there, we're going to subtract cost of goods sold. Now, this will calculate differently under absorption costing because recall under variable costing, we only used direct materials, direct labor, and variable overhead. Only variable cost made up cost of goods sold. Under absorption costing, cost of goods sold absorbs all of our product cost. So direct materials, direct labor, variable overhead, and fixed overhead. So any fixed manufacturing cost would also be absorbed by cost of goods sold. So we have to consider all that stuff. So we have fixed manufacturing cost of $2 million under absorption costing that would get absorbed into cost of goods sold based on the number of units that we produced. We produced 500 and we want to multiply that times the number of units that we actually sold, which is 350 since we're talking about cost of goods sold. Then we'll add to that our other manufacturing cost, which were our variable manufacturing costs per unit which were $10,000 times the number of units sold. And that comes out to be $4.9 million. 
Now we can compute our gross profit and that should come out to be three and a half million. And from here, we'll subtract out our operating expenses, both fixed and variable. So we'll start with variable. And if we look at the data, we find that we have $3,000 in variable operating cost per unit sold. And then we have our fixed operating expenses, which they tell us are marketing costs of $600,000. And that will leave us with operating income of $1,650,000 for the month of April. Under absorption costing. Now, once again, let's take a look at the inventory T account here for April just to make sure that everything is coming out the way we expect it to. So this should be cost of goods sold here. All right, so beginning inventory again is zero. But now under absorption costing, we don't only need variable manufacturing costs, we also need any allocated fixed cost as well. So under our variable manufacturing cost, they were $10,000 times the number of units produced, which in this case were 500. So that gives us variable manufacturing cost of 5 million just like before. But now we have this allocated fixed cost piece, which is based on that $2 million divided by 500 units, which is our rate, which comes out to be $4,000, times the number of units that we produced this period, which happens to equal the amount that we budgeted. So the allocated fixed cost are what they're supposed to be, $2 million. In our ending inventory, we have 150 units times the amount of the per unit cost. Well, the per unit variable manufacturing was 10,000, but we also have a per unit fixed allocation rate which is based on the two million divided by 500, which is $4,000. So our ending inventory is based on our total product cost of $14,000 per unit. So our ending inventory will be $2,100,000. So now we have a total of $7 million in inventory, less our ending, what we have left of 2.1 million, gives us a cost of goods sold of $4,900,000 thousand dollars, which is the same thing that we have already previously calculated. So we are happy, happy. Now I would like for you to attempt the month of May. Once you think you have got the month of May, and also do the T account, come back and we will take a look at it together. All right, so here we have both months, April and May. And I'm hoping that revenues and cost of goods sold, we figured that out pretty well, as well as the variable and fixed cost on the income statement. Um, the only thing that I might, we might have difficulty is on the cost of goods sold number, which we found here in the cost of goods sold T account. So let's take a look at this one. So if you'll call, recall, we allocate fixed cost based on a certain rate, which we calculated that to be $4,000 per unit that we produced. Well, we budgeted to produce five, 500, 
which is what that two million is based on. But in this instance, in the month of May, we only produced 400. So only 1.6 million in those fixed costs got allocated to our inventory. When in reality, 2 million should have gotten allocated. But because of our allocation rate, it didn't. So our cost of goods sold is currently under allocated or under applied, if you will. So we come out with an original cost of goods sold of $7,280,000. However, we were 100 units. We produced 100 units less than what we budgeted to produce. So we have what's called a production volume variance of 100 units. And because we produced 100 less than we thought we would, it's considered an unfavorable variance. And unfavorable variances increase cost of goods sold because they're bad. They're not good. Okay, they're unfavorable because we didn't produce enough. So the difference here is going to increase cost of goods sold. So technically, this is the $4,000 rate times the 100 units, the variance in the number of units that we, that we didn't produce, uh, that we budgeted that we would produce. Now... Just to go a step further, if we had produced, say, 600 units and budgeted to produce 500, then we would have allocated too much fixed cost right here. This would have been more than $2 million. So then the production volume, volume variance would have reduced the cost of goods sold. This would have been a favorable variance. So if we had had a production volume variance that was favorable, we produced more than we thought we would, it would need to reduce cost of goods sold because we would have, we would have allocated too many fixed costs to our inventory.